Number seven, how to walk in integrity. How to walk in integrity. So we're going to be talking about integrity, and I want to bring up some things, maybe some thoughts you might have not have thought of when it deals with this subject matter. When I think of integrity, I think about God is not one that he should lie. So we can trust that God will always keep his word. He's integral. We can use the word for integrity as he's integral. In other words, he never changes. He, if he gave his word, then he will keep his word, right? So we can trust in God's word. Amen. One of the scriptures says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not spoken and will he not bring it to pass? In the beginning was the word, John 1.1. 1, 1. And the word was with God and the word was God. So we know that our God is perfect. And taking our God whose character is perfect is to line his word up with the character that's perfect with God. Amen? <clears throat> Another thing that I wanted to bring up is not only God is in, it will back his word, but it says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not. So we can believe that the word is integral. And did you know in the Psalms, I think it's Psalms 82, verse 2, if I get that wrong, please forgive me. It says that God honors his word above his name. So in other words, God puts his word out and he's going to see that it's full of integrity and that God is full of integrity. So we know that the best example that all of us have is our God is integral. In other words, we can trust in him with all our heart and lean not to our own understanding. Can you say amen? So in this lesson tonight, and I'm reading your paragraph, we will point out that we are to walk with integrity. People are looking for those, those believers who hang and have it going for themselves because of integrity. We are the salt of the earth, right? A city that sat on a hill. Examples of the influence of our Lord in our lives and our fellowship with him. When something has integrity, such as our deck, we're going to use my deck in the back. That means it can hold a certain amount of weight. Let's say it can hold a 1,500 pounds. I mean, that's low. It can hold more than that. So the integral part of that deck is to be able to hold at least 1,500 pounds, right? If you look at the chairs, before you sit down in a chair, you must wonder if that chair is going to be able to hold your body, right? So that chair has to have the integrity to be able to hold you. Otherwise, it would be a faulty chair. Well, we got that, Pastor Kerry. I'm going to wrap this all in with the teaching we're going to learn, okay? So there are a lot of people who have tremendous amount of integrity. They mean what they say. They say what they mean. If they're going to be there, they're going to be there. They're never going to promise without keeping that word. They, 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 they promise, but they do not break it to their own hurt. When a business such as a bank or an investment center has integrity, you can commit on them to keep their word to you. When your, your home that you bought and your contract is full of integrity, you know that you can hold the seller to that contract. Amen. And when we know our God is full of integrity, we can hold God to his word. He does not get insulted when we hold him to his word. In fact, it actually compliments him. Lord, your word said, and he says, yeah, are you going to believe it? Are you going to act on it? You know, Lord, your word says, yeah, are you going to believe it? Are you going to act on it? Amen. And we believe it and we act on it because we know God keeps his word. Can you say amen? So we're still in the upper paragraph there. You and I are to walk in integrity. Do you believe that? Can we be counted on as keeping our word to somebody? Can we be, maintain our walk with integrity and finish our race? Now, let me ask you. When the scripture says, run the race that is set before you, 
What is the race? You over there. It's your life. So usually in a race, we're competing against something, right? Come on now, catch me. In a race, in our life, we're competing against something. This is what maybe you don't understand, maybe you do. Those of you understand this. You are not competing against other Christians. It's not a meatloaf con contest. You know what I mean? Who makes the best meatloaf? What it is, is you're competing. Now listen to me carefully. It might sting a little bit, but I'm trying not to cause any of that. You are competing with your flesh. Now your flesh has lots of flaws. I want you to listen to when I quote this. Okay? The idea is you're competing to overcome the flaws that you, you or what I or anybody for that matter, allowed in our life that is weighing us down. So the scripture says, set aside every weight and sin. Now we think of sin as something nasty. But you've got to realize that sin is all the way to the nastiest, nastiest thing. All the way to the simple, I keep missing the mark. I keep making the same mistake. So the race that's set before us is us competing against our flesh so that we get better daily and we don't remain the same and grow mold. Someone say, say amen. All right, try to keep that really as positive as we can. So if it's losing weight, you better be losing weight. Hello. And not ignore it. If you're, it's a diet thing and you can't be eating certain foods, but you just love that food, you know, that one particular item, and you splurge once in a while, and so you're going to face a little bit of upsetness or whatever. The idea is you're running a race to overcome with God. Now, you're not running that race alone. God is in you, and he's helping you. But without consulting your coach, you're not going to be able to win over those weights. Sometimes it's so seemly beset us. Now, here's the thing. Didn't God say, keep your eyes off of everybody else's moat, speck, right? Why? Because we got enough specks of our own. So our race is we deal with our relationship with God and we deal with the competition in our life that is our flesh. What does our flesh do? It fights against the will of God and says, I can do it on my own. So you're in competition with your flesh, not Pastor Carey's flesh. Can you say amen? I got my own problems. Now, there's a lot of wisdom in what I just said to you. I hope you get that and reflect it because a lot of Christians get themselves in trouble because they look at the faults of others too much and they justify not running their race, not laying aside their weight and not laying aside their sin. They're so busy justifying not doing that and tick-tock, tick-tock and your life is passing away and you're not dealing with it. One day you'll wake up and you're 60, you're 70, and you still look the same, you still act the same. Not a good race, would you say? <laughs> you know, you're not winning the Kentucky Derby, so let's move on. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 9. We're going to look at Solomon for just a minute here. Now, what was Solomon so blessed with? He was blessed with wisdom. And even a greater than Solomon is here in our heart. Everyone, who lives in our heart? God does. Isn't he better than Solomon? Isn't his wisdom wiser than Solomon? So look at yourself and say, wise up. Wise up. Can't blame me and I can't blame you. So we got to let the wisdom, we got to let what God said is, that's put us in the inside and work it out to the outside. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So he says, and I came, and it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord. Remember, he built the temple and the king's house and all of Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared in the first time in Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, 
I have heard your prayer and your supplications, your petitionings that you have made before me. And I have consecrated the house which you have built and put in my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now God's always, remember, in the beginning, God lost his hold on this planet when Adam gave it to the devil. So God has been longing to dwell with mankind. He, been, he even says in the promises that I will love to tabernacle amongst my people. He even said, David, I want you to build a tabernacle in the wilderness so I could come and, and visit with you. The Ark of the Covenant, what was the purpose thereof? It was the mouth, mouthpiece and the manifestation, sta uh, manifestation station where God would appear. And when they would put the Ark of the Covenant in front, when they put Jesus first, the Ark of the Covenant first, they won the wars. And when the ark was always ignored and going to church is ignored, then the Israelites got into big trouble. Remember, we're in a competition. They were in a competition back there competing with themselves. Hello. Amen. And so back then, it was a tough race. Why? Because if you failed, I mean, it was a bigger penalty. All right, let's move past on. Now, look at this. All right, it says now, here's the Lord speaking. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked in what? In integrity of heart and uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you. And if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. And I will prepare, uh, I will, that I have promised your father David, saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. And we know that Jesus came through the line of David, didn't he? We won't go into uh, Solomon's sin, okay? But Satan really worked on Solomon. We, you guys are reading what? Ecclesiastics, Amen. And uh, you want to get real depressed? Read Lamentations. Lamentations be moaning and sorrowing, regretting, you know. <laughs> well, bless God, we're not there. Can you say amen? All right. A couple of thoughts I want to throw at you in your one through four should say thought on there. First one is when we walk with integrity. Remember we talked about sitting in a chair because we know the chair is integral. Also, too, those that deal with plumbing, or electricity, they have to test the lines. So they had to make sure that the pipe could handle the pressure. So they make sure they test it so it proves to be integral, right? And if they design a boat, you want to make sure it floats. It's integral. Can you say amen? I know I'm making light of that. So how about you? Can God count on us? Are we really integral? Now, the idea about Asking a question like that, it's not to get us to come under condemnation or think that, that anything. It's just you need to ask yourself. Remember we talked about taking a time every week where you and God sit down and evaluate you. It's not an easy thing to do. Sit down and say, God, all right, I'm opening my heart. Have at her. What do I need to work on? I got a pen and a paper here, God. And we really need to get a checkup from the neck up, I would say once a week. I mean, some people every day, but once a week. Now, I'm not saying don't be with God first thing every, every morning. What I'm saying is the first thing every morning, that's the charging station. That's the killing the weed station. That's the reprogramming your mind station. That is, give ear to my prayer in the morning station, where God writes me, tunes me, gets me in touch, and I don't start my day without doing that. And it doesn't take more than 5, 10, 15 minutes, depending on how, how the, your flesh has been doing. <laughs> you know, sometimes we can be pretty ornery in the night. Boy, I, I know somebody get upset four or five times during the day, and you think he lost salvation. <laughs> And you go, what in the world? He says, that's all right, I'll get to it. God's helping me. Amen. So we're beginning to realize. And I, let me encourage you to laugh at yourself once in a while. 
Because you can get pretty intense because really, whether we know it or not, there's plenty enough wrong with us that we don't have any right to criticize anyone else. All right. So again, first thought is when we walk with integrity before God, God will keep his blessings coming on us. Why? Because we're not double-minded. His promises say that he will. God shall supply all of our need according to his riches and glory. One of the names for God is El Shaddai, the all-providing, never-stopping providing one. The key of stopping the blessings of God is us stopping to be integral. How do we stop being in, uh, stop being integral? By uh, walking in the flesh. We all know the story, okay? Because our flesh only thinks about how can I get away with something? How can I make myself look more important? How can I hide from reality? I have people run from me sometimes because they don't want to face up to the integral instead of making an excuse. Well, I blew it. See, it's good to say, hey, I blew it. I made a mistake. You know why? It makes us feel normal because Jesus then wouldn't have to come if you were all perfect, right? Look at your neighbor and say, I knew you were perfect. All right, second thing I want to give you is the word integrity. Listen what it means. It means honesty, sincerity. It's the singleness of purpose. Thirdly, Jesus described it as, in this way, it's a pure purity of heart, singleness of purpose, and purity of motive. In order to get that way, you have to go to God, and he has to get you that way. Amen? I don't care how many rodeos you've been in, how many parades. The idea is you can't do this. We rely on our master. We rely on our God. And listen, God resists the proud. So the first thing you need to do is when you get up and you look like a, somebody been dragged through a knot hole backwards, Great time to be humble and talk to God. <laughs> hey, God, how you doing, dude? No. We, we, God knows all about us. Just get in there and talk with God and lay it all open and let God heal you and make you better. Say amen, somebody. All right. And then fourthly, the simplest of all, the old Greek word or the Hebrew word means it's the word Tom. It means simplistic and sound and upright and solid. Amen? That's you. You're full of integrity. Now, if you think about it, the only time that we wouldn't be so integral was, would be if our mind was on ourselves or we were in the flesh. Now, I know I talk a lot about the flesh, but not in a, in a negative way. Paul, well, I tell you what, our, the apostle Paul, he wanted to get, get with God so bad. He wanted so bad. I mean, he was the top of his class. And then he finally confesses. He says, even the good I desire to be, I always find evils present with me. So at least God brought him to a place of realizing that he is nothing without God. That he can do nothing without God. Great place to be. Someone say amen. All right. Never lose your joy of purpose. Someone say amen. The Bible says, don't grow weary in doing good. So, folks, we talked about burnout. Remember that about 20 years ago, everybody was talking about, oh, we don't want to get burned out. We want to, listen, if you're doing things for God and you're doing them without God encouraging you to do them, then you're doing them with physical energy that will grow tired and weary. The idea is you don't do it in your own energy. You get up, you seek God, you get filled up, you get the gas tank full, you get your oil changed, and you get out there and you do it under his power. And then you don't burn out. You burn on. Okay, moving right along. So listen to this. Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. Now folks, salt has so many different values. But salt was like money. So if you wanted your, flavor, your life full of flavor, you got salt. You wanted your food full of flavor, you got salt. Amen. If you wanted things preserved, you used salt. 
So it says that you are the salt of the earth. You're here to help other people, to preserve other people. You're here to add life's flavor. So don't run around with a frown on your face. Moving right past us. Now listen. And it says, but if the salt loses its flavor, you can put the word purpose, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by what? By man. A person who's a negative Christian, the world will make a heyday and make fun of them. Trampled under feet by man. And you call yourself a Christian. They're out there. Can you say amen? That's why I always used to tell everybody, if you're going to make a mistake, do it by yourself. Don't try to influence anybody else with it. <laughs> Can you say amen? Hallelujah. All right, so let's go on. So it says if the salt loses its flavor, purpose, it isn't good for nothing. How many know that you are good for good things? Can you say amen? And then it says you are a light of the world, a city that's set on a hill, cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a, bush, a basket, uh, but, they, a lamp, but rather on a lampstand that it gives light to those who are in the house. Folks, when people come and they visit with you, there should be enough light shining from us that it gives them hope and encouragement and will cause them to be jealous of what you have. That's what a witness is. You are a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and of his power. Can you say amen? All right, moving right along. All right. So you can't hide it under a basket. You put it on a lampstand. It gives light to those people who come into your life. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Do people see your good works? Hope so. We were created for them. Can you say amen? A couple of points underneath that. Number one, we are the salt of the earth. We preserve and we add flavor. Two, we are the light of the world. We shine into darkness and people can begin to see hope and see the way. Thirdly, we must maintain this integrity before God. Why? Because God needs to trust in us obeying him. Everybody says, I want to be used of God. Then God asks you to do something and you don't do it. Next time he asks you, it's going to be twice as long before he asks you. Because God will not give something to someone if they won't keep their word to him. Doesn't mean you lose heaven or lose your salvation. No, just God won't use you. And we have a lot of Christians sitting around not being used of God. They should be laying hands on the sick and sharing the gospel. Open the eyes of the blind. Set at liberty them that are bruised. Huh? That's what Jesus does in us. Amen. I've had people come to me and say, I want what you have. I said, well, I don't have anything but Jesus. I don't care. I want it. End up laying on the floor, but the power of God laid, laid them out. They said, what in the world was that? Let me sit down and talk to you about it. You got about a half an hour? Let's talk about the power of God. Amen? It's really unique that you and I... When we're full of integrity and we obey God and God gets to the point where he can actually not just trust in our flesh, but he can trust in his spirit in you, then what happens is he begins to utilize you more and your life takes on a little more adventure. How many could use a little more adventure sometimes? Yeah, we all could. As we're all yawning. I need a little more adventure. Amen. Okay. So we must maintain integrity for a witness for others. And then fourthly, this is the question. Are we doing what God designed for us to do? And are we doing it with integrity? Hello. That's just a question you need to ask God. Amen. Number one, integrity shows consistency and soundness of character. Somebody that's full of integrity when it comes to the word, they'll grow like gangbusters. 
Somebody that's not consistent. I'm, I'm amazed. Years ago, I'd have people that were studying. They were trying to be leadership in the church, but they'd never sit and listen to a sermon. They'd always be too busy to do this, too busy to do that. And they did begin to fall by the wayside because it takes a good, solid word and the integrity of the word in our heart for us to act on. We need to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So God help us to be a doer of the word and not fall under condemnation if we can't keep all of it right now. This is not the law. Amen. Being sincere and honest before God is all God really wants us to do. And be willing to try. Be willing and obedient. It says we will eat the good of the land. Now I love what Titus 2 verses 6 through 8 says. Likewise exhort the younger men to be sober minded. All things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, teachings of the word. Showing integrity. You keep your word, you're a man or woman of your word. You say what you mean, you mean what you say. Your reverence, your respectful, your incorruptibility, you don't compromise. You have sound speech, you don't talk through the side of your mouth, okay? We don't, we won't, I won't go into tremendous detail, it's not necessary because none of you guys have that problem. Uh, that cannot be condemned, you know? I love these people. Oh, yeah, you can count on me, you can count on me. Well, don't say that unless you can count, be counted on. Hello? You see, whether you know it or not, some people go on what you say. And if you say you're going to do something, they're waiting for you to do it. Hello? And when you don't, in their mind, God bless their soul, you've lost integrity. Hello? I've been an employer for years and years and years and years and years. I've also been an employee. And when, when my employees don't do what they say they're going to do, I can't trust them. They lose their integrity. Can God trust in us? Will we do what God, with God's help, do what we said we're going to do? And we will do it because we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. Amen? All right, so let's go on. True fulfillment comes for you and I from integrity. Remember, integrity is not being perfect. It's being sincere with consistency. Someone who God can count on. You are to be trusted. You are to have integrity. Should be your strength. If a bridge has integrity, it can be driven over. But if a compromised bridge is there, you might have hesitance to get involved. Okay? A church must appear full of integrity. Hello? The people, the leaders of the church must be full of integrity. Hello? Because no one will trust something if that thing is not strong and integral. It's just an amen there, okay? So let's look at this. Proverbs 25 through 7 says this. Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Who lives in our heart? Jesus. So who can we draw from? Jesus. Draw nigh to me, resist the devil, and he will. Amen. Yeah, and I, I, I can, most people can tell if you've been drawn nigh to God or not. It's pretty obvious, okay? Okay, okay, so most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful or an integral man? The righteous man walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. Wow, what a scripture, huh? Look at point one. We are to walk with integrity, not allowing, allowing anything to compromise us or cause us to be ineffective. Two, whether we know it or not, people are looking at our integrity. They need to see God working in us and that we keep our words. And somebody say amen. amen. And then thirdly, to conform to the world and to compromise is what weakness weakens our integrity. People then lose their trust. In others, take a look at society right now. 
People are just afraid and full of mistrust and making up lies, exactly what the devil wants. He feeds off of it. So you and I as a Christian, we need to walk with integrity before God and before others. Why? Because then people can see that we have a relationship with God and we are who we say we are. There's a lot of people saying, hey, I'm this and hey, I'm that. But if I don't see your walk matching your words, then I'm going to come to you one day and say, please don't brag so much. Let's see you live up to what you think you are. Everyone smile at someone and say, you need improvement. Smile at someone and say, you need improvement and I'll pray for you. You see, people can't necessarily, they, they think you're, well, that's hard to say to somebody. Well, it better, it better be us saying it in a loving, friendly ma matter because how many here are perfect? How many here could use some improving? Yes, Come on. Honesty is what God is looking for. He's looking for your omen, openness before God. God, you know, in my condition, can't do a thing. And I'm not here to dazzle you, but I tell you, you and me together, you taking the lead. Amen. You see, and that's how you should greet him in the morning. All right, let's move on. Okay, so Proverbs 10, 8, 9 says this. A wise, excuse me, the wise in the heart will receive commandments. But a pratting fool will fail. He who walks with integrity walks sincerely. But he who perverts his ways will, come, uh, will become known. So what is a pervert your ways? Are we some pervert somewhere? No, that's not what it's talking. The word pervert is an old English word which means go against the grain. Or trying to swim upstream or fight against the current. You know, say, well, I could be good. So, uh, come on, let's get right with it. The idea is, if you've got integrity, God can count on you. But it's with sincerity. But somebody who perverts their ways is somebody that vacillates. It's also called in the New Testament, James, a double-minded man. They pervert their way. Let not that man think he shall receive anything. Of the Lord. A double minded man, flesh, spirit, spirit, flesh, flesh, spirit, spirit, flesh, 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 spirit, spirit, man, is unstable in all his ways. Let not that person think that he can receive anything from the Lord. Stop, get down, and meet with God and get that straightened, and don't go another hour without that being dealt with. Someone say integrity. Not excusing me. Whoops, I came right out. I'm sorry about that. All right, so let's look at this. What is, what, what is a pratting fool? I mean, it's a Proverbs. Someone who talks too much. Chatters about babbles without thought. This is a pratting fool. And this will cause a person's brain to kind of compromise. How many has ever had, I'm going to go through something. Like today, I had just the weirdest thought come right through my mind. Now, I know that didn't come from me, nor any of my memories. I know that was shot at me through an outside spirit, okay? Then there are those thoughts, maybe a memory or something triggered a thought, whether it be positive or negative. Those are different. You can handle those thoughts and say, just forget that. Like, for example, I'll think about something that happened in my old neighborhood, and it'll follow a trail in my mind all the way up. And so you, you, if you don't like the trail that's going, I just shut it down by praising the Lord or something. But the idea, the idea is there are a lot of people that just prat about and talk whatever comes to their mind. I call it verbal vomit or, I don't know, interruptism, can't keep quietism. Scripture really says that a person that talks too much can get themselves in trouble and miss the mark. It even says it harsher than that. It says that a person that talks too much always causes themselves to sin because talking too much. 
Why? Because when you talk a lot, you see a lot of visions, a lot of things maybe you talk yourself into or you talk yourself from doing what God asks you to do. So sometimes your mind prating about, don't put it to words and certainly don't take it all around to your neighbors. Everyone say, I got that. True fulfillment comes from you and I living an integral life before God and man. You can sleep at night. You didn't make promises you didn't keep. Hello? You didn't tell God something and had to be reminded or anything. Because you think about what you say and, and you just don't say it too quickly. And you kind of make sure because why? People are known by how they speak. Do you know that? How about the car salesmen? That's yeah, some of them. But actually, once in a while, you can tell by how a person speaks if they have integrity or not. Hello, and even in the car salesman business, we bought some good cars from car salesmen. But we made them speak integrity by putting the ball in their court and controlling the way they hit it. Now, if you get that way, you know you're listening how God's wisdom will show you how to handle that, okay? Now, I'm not, I can't do any of that. So, our, we are the children of light. Can you say amen? Our testimony is our integrity. Luke 11, 33 through 36 says, No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it under a uh, puts it in a secret place or under a basket. See, this is from Luke. It's a little bit different. But on a lampstand. And those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. What is it? So whatever you stare at, it's going to make a picture. So if you're staring at your problems, you're going to see nothing but your problems. If you're staring at somebody else's fault, all you're going to do is see their faults. So next time they come in the room, you're going to talk to them as seeing them with faults. Judge not, lest you be judged. Amen. So you can see in the integral part of things, we're not as good as we think we are because there's a lot of adjustments we need to make. So please mellow out, be humble, and let God operate on your quirks. Amen? Before we all become jerks. Okay? We don't want to do that. I, I find there's a lot of people not going to a church because they ran into somebody who supposedly representing Jesus and they just rip somebody, another one, instead of loving on them. So we want to watch that. So it goes on to say, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good or single... Your whole body will be full of light. But when your eye is bad or out of focus, your body also will be full of darkness. See, so you're not being integral. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you, what you operate and what you understand, is not darkness. If then the whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. So who do we focus on? Jesus. Amen. Who makes us full of integrity? Jesus. Amen. Where is our eyes focused on singly? On Jesus. And then we know we'll be filled with light. Amen. So we want to be in, full of integrity. A couple of points under that. Number one, God lit your lamp. We are the light of the world, right? But can anybody see God in you? Say yes. yes. You want, most people just kind of wonder. This is, this is the thing. I'm going to share this with you. This is called an evangelistic trick. <clears throat> it's great for altar calls. You put something out there like, now everyone of you have got something you're dealing with, something that you're working on. And I know and you know, and you've been crying out and there's something there. So if that's you, come up from. Well, that's everybody. <laughs> if you think about it. It's everybody. And if they're real sincere, we'll naturally want to deal with it. And I love altar calls and I love that. But I'm not going to appeal to your 
lacking, I'm going to appeal to God providing for your lack. It's a different kind of altar call. And so you'll find out that I, am, I don't do a whole lot of altar calls because I want you to be able to receive from God in the very seat to your sitting. Why should I coerce you to the front? If you got an hour, say something. When you first come on in, let's lay hands on you then. Why sit through the service waiting for an altar call? No, sometimes, right? But we all need the angel of the Lord come on down to the pool and stir up the waters so everybody can run and jump in. Now, what I just said was one of the evangelistic tree, uh, tricks of the trade and I, something that I used to fall privy to myself. And I found there's a better way to do that. Teach the word, give an appeal. Somebody want this in the word? Would you like to have this in your life? Then they're coming for, to the Lord for something better. They're not coming before the Lord because they need something fixed. You're supposed to do that at home. Hello? You're supposed to do it in your prayer closet. And by the time you do that all week long, by the time you come Sunday, you shouldn't have any problems. You've been meeting with God six times and now it's the seventh time. You're in church. Yes. And you got a problem? You see how silly that becomes sometimes? If we're full of integrity, God will say, come on, I want to see you. You're not, you're not feeling well? Come on, let's meet together. But our flesh says, no, and, you know, and, you know, and we'll sit around and feel bad. So let's not do that. Say amen. <laughs> Thirdly, if your eyes are on God, then you're filled with light. Remember Adam and Eve? They were so filled with light, they didn't even notice anything wrong. What does the Bible say? First Corinthians 13 doesn't even notice when others do it wrong. Doesn't make lists. Don't keep tallies. Moving right along. Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 11. For you were once dark, darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Yay! Walk as children of light. See, now you're in the light of the Lord, but now he says something. He says, walk in the light. Completely different. You are in the light, but now you've got to do something with the light. You've got to walk in it. That means one foot after the other through your daily day, you've got to walk with Jesus in the light. That's the way it is, but really it's not, doesn't sound silly like that. But, but then it goes, okay, all right. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness. So if you have the fruit of the Spirit operating in you, everything you do is going to be on the good. Can you say amen? amen? It's going to be righteous. Because God lives in you and he's righteous. Therefore, everything that you do, you're trying to do it right for God. Not to impress others. And truth. So it's on all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. How many here so far found out what he likes and dislikes? So, yeah. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Finally, my last point, I got seven or eight minutes for you. Walking in integrity, being sincere, being honest, and trustworthy, we are guaranteed favor then. Can you say amen? Jesus says, I come not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Well, you and I, if we really think about it, we, we want to do nothing more than to please God and be with him. That's all we want. And so don't let the enemy, or anybody for that matter, keep you from that very goal. So keep your eyes on the Lord Keep talking with them and he's going to be giving you wisdom. Showing you how to step things through. Why? Only that work for you. You see, I can have a general answer for you. But when God speaks to you, he gives you the specifics on the general answer. For example, the word of God is the general direction in which the Holy Spirit leads us. The word of God is the general direction. Okay. Being led by the Spirit is specific directions. So you can get a general direction and get specifics in the project. 
Do it this way. Don't do it that way. Amen. Get it done in two weeks. Don't take a, a whole half year. Hello. Listening to the Holy Spirit to give you the detail on the general understanding. Can you say amen? So, we are guaranteed favor when we walk with sincerity and honesty and we can be trusted. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. I'll read rather quickly. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that they, that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep. See a lot of that lately. As others do. But let us watch and be sober. For those that sleep, sleep at night. And those that get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, who whether we be wake or whether we be asleep dead in Christ, we should know we shall live together with him. <clears throat> then it says something really strange. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are doing. Amen. So if you look at the church, really if we're concentrating with the Lord and we're meaning on him on a regular basis, that's integrity. You see, if you promise God, Lord, you can count on me. I'm going to meet with you every day faithfully and you don't do it. Rather, you don't ever make a promise like that another time in your life to make it than not keep it. So don't make promises to God. He's not asking for you to. He's just asking for you to fall in love with him. And then when you're short or you're failing in areas, you say, God, I really need your help. I really, really need your help. And I'm going to just believe that you're going to start working on me. And I thank you for that. You see? And it's sincerity. It's integrity. And then when God begins to change us on the inside... He knows what he's working out so he can count on us. He knows in my life, and I'm going to use me, what he can count on me about and what areas I need work on. So he's not going to ask you to do something for him if you are going to do it looking like a ding dong. He's going to count on you to do the things that you're good at. And that he can make you even better at. Hello. And folks, you know, when you tell somebody you're good at something and everybody can see plainly, you haven't got a clue. Please don't keep on saying you're good at it. Go to God and say, make me good at it. Can you see? <laughs> because when we start denying things, here's another one. Everybody wants me changed. They just want to change me. If you've got an attitude like that, you're going to get drop kicked through life because you need to change daily. Because guess what? If you don't change your underwear, you're going to stink. And if your life doesn't change, you're going to molt. You're going to get crabby. You're going to get stale. And then God use me. He says, I'd love to, but you need to take a bath. And so those are the harsh realities. I went to my, my pastor one time, and I'll finish up with this. When I was young and I was learning God had already told me that I was going to do something for him. And everybody in the room, we had 30 faithful followers that were disciples of God. They were really sold out. Every time church store opens, they were there. I mean, at least 30. They weren't doing all this other. They weren't making doctor's appointments on the day they needed to study the word. They were just there. There's something wrong and missing in these day and ages. People have lost the value of God's word. 
They've lost the ability to be full of integrity. And, you know, I think it's breaking, you know, I know God's heart's not going to break, but I think it kind of breaks and grieves the Holy Spirit that he doesn't have more to work with. Hello? I, I can see many pastors look out in their congregation and say, I got the faithful five, and they're already working too much. <laughs> Hello? Train, delegate, train, delegate, train. If you're doing the same old thing you always used to do, you're trying to own it instead of give it away. So just think of those things and learn integrity. A couple of things. Times and seasons are our signals. The day is approaching, right? Two, we are people of integrity. We're walking in the light. We keep our word and our promises to God and to each other. Please don't tell me what you're going to do. Just do it and show me. And I'll go, wow, isn't that good? But I have people tell me, you know, don't do this to other people. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then the enemy somehow stops them from doing it. And now they feel goofy. No, don't do that. You're making promises all the time. And you know why we make promises? Because we hope to make up for the ones we didn't keep. Don't make promises. So God lays it on your heart. Don't tell somebody, you know what God laid it on my heart? Buy Pastor Carrie and Linda a car. And you tell everybody. That isn't God wanting you to tell everybody. Go buy one. We'll take it. <laughs> my wife's laughing. But anyway, you know, do what the Lord tells you to do. There's always a blessing in it. But we got to do it with integrity. Amen. So this integrity keeps us in the light, keeps us fresh before God, and causes us to always want to be true, balanced, and complete. Can you say amen? 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light, as Christ is in the light, and how we have fellowship with another, and the blood constantly cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 2, 10 says, he who loves his brother abides in the light. And there's no occasion of stumbling in him. Did you get something out of that tonight? You got any questions? Anything you want to add?